Let's pray. Jesus, would you bless us today as we think about being thankful people and what it means to live a thankful life, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're talking about giving thanks. A couple of famous verses on that. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Don't forget the thanksgiving, right? Let your requests be made known to God. Paul says, be sure that your prayers include thanksgiving. Go ahead and, give, go ahead and ask, but also thanksgiving. And the word there is eucharista, not eux, but eucharista. We use it with a ch in our language, but eucharista, you kind of got to spit on the x with a ch. Eucharista. Another verse, 1 Thessalonians 5.18, in everything give thanks. Now that's a challenge, isn't it? We'll come back to that verse that's eucharisteo. It's the verb form and the noun form. You know the difference between a noun and a verb. A noun is the thing, and the verb is doing the thing, right? So in the first verse, you're supposed to have your prayers be with thanksgiving the thing, whatever that is. In the second verse there, for Thessalonians 5.18, it's a verb. Do the thing. In everything, give thanks, okay? Now, the word eucharisteo, eucharisteo and eucharistia, it's where we get the word eucharist. You know, we call it the communion, but some of the more um, liturgical denominations, Episcopalians and uh, uh, I think Lutherans and others, call the communion service the Eucharist. And it comes from this word. Because you see, the Bible says that Jesus took bread and eucharisteo, and broke it. That's the word. So he gave thanks. He Eucharisted and gave it to them saying, this is my body. Matthew 26, 27, then he took the cup and Eucharisteo. Okay, so he Eucharisted. He gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink from it all of you. That's why the communion service is called the Eucharist. It's the giving of thanks. Remember when Jesus took the five loaves and two fishes? He Eucharisted again, he gave thanks, and he broke them and he gave them out, okay? So that's where the word came from. Now the word Eucharisteo comes from, is, is based on the word charis, which is the Greek word for grace. I find this very interesting where this word, what's behind the word Eucharisteo. Charis is grace, as in, for by grace you have been saved through faith, right? Out of yourselves it's a gift of God. The whole concept of charis, grace, is the concept of something that you are freely given, which you don't deserve, which is really, really, really good. Okay? That's kind of what that is all about. And actually the word charis is built on the word hurrah. But that's not where we get hurrah from in the English language, but that's how it's said, hurrah, which is the noun for joy. The fruit of the Spirit is love, hara, and peace, right? Agape, hara, and Irene, from which we get Irene. That's the name peace in the Greek. So if you're named Irene, you're all about peace, okay? And there is a verb, hara is the thing. It's the noun, joy, whatever that is. And the verb hairo is rejoice. That's doing the thing. That's doing joy, okay? Um, as Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. Are you with me so far? All right. So here's kind of what I want you to get from this. We have the word hydro and hara, which, re which refer to joy and rejoicing. Now, I looked up these words in a thing called the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. And if I had them in paper form, they'd take a whole shelf. But they all fit right here in my computer. And I looked it up. And it said about the word hara and hairo, it is everywhere a cumulative accumulation of existence, joy, beauty, a spark divine. It strains beyond itself as direct feeling it creates no problems. And I read that and I says, what in the world is that saying? So why would I put it on the screen? Because I figured out what it meant, and I think it's pretty good, actually. The word hara, or joy, 
in the Greek, in everywhere, it, it is everywhere accumulation of existence. The idea of joy is reaching the fullness of life. The accumulation of existence, the sum of it all. If you are living to the max, that's joy. Okay? And then it has that little quote from somewhere, joy, beauty, a spark divine. And then it strains beyond itself. In other words, the concept of joy is that it explains something that it can't reach. It explains something that's even better than it's trying to explain. Is there anything on this earth that you can think of that when you experience it, it's even better than you anticipated? I've discovered everything on this earth seems to want you wanting more. It's never fully satisfying. The concept of joy is it something that's beyond itself. It's truly satisfying. It doesn't run out. It doesn't come short. Nobody finally yells out, time's up, you know, party's over, turn out the lights. And then the last phrase, as direct feeling, it creates no problems. How many of you have run into problems because you went after good feelings? Drugs make you feel really good, so I've been told. But what's the problem? You have to have a bigger dose and a bigger dose to get the same feeling again, and you end up addicted, and you end up ruining your health, and you end up killing yourself. Right? right. Going after the good feeling. Joy is a feeling that creates no problems. No side effects, no downside, no negatives. It doesn't bite you in the backside after you had a good time. I wrote some stuff down here. Joy is, it strains beyond itself. It's even better than you thought it was going to be and promises to be. It's a wonderful feeling that creates no problems, an eternal joyous high. Real life, unimaginable life, like in Eden, all good, no bad. No death, no decay, no sorrow, no pain. It's not just not what's not there, bad, but it's indescribable joy, love, wonder, adventure, meaning, relationships that actually work. It's, it strains to the utmost. Perfect bliss, unimaginable wonder, absolute joy, utopia, rapture, nirvana, Shangri-La, paradise, heaven, with no downside that will come back and bite you. And it gets, it goes on and on, and it gets better and better forever and ever. You got that? So I, I kind of wanted you to get a feel of joy. What it, what, it, what it means. Have you experienced some joy in your life? Or have you just had a little bit of fun? Fun, again, is going after the endorphin rush. I remember getting on the um, California Experience roller coaster at Disneyland for the first time. And it's one of these, it doesn't go up high to start, it starts down low, but it has a magnetic acceleration. It shoots you out from about zero to 80 in about two seconds, you know. And then you're going around and up and down. Man, the first time that was great, so I went and got in the short single line and got on again and it was great and I got on again and it was great but you know I started getting used to it about the sixth time it was still fun but I wanted to go a little faster right you get what I'm saying anything we do for fun is designed around an endorphin rush and usually we keep pushing that endorphin rush and we end up addicted disappointed and often dead Right? That's fun. 
Joy is totally different. Because joy is something that is enrapturing that you can experience even if you're in pain and difficulty. Joy is an inner bubbling spring. Does that make sense? So, we then back this thing up. You go from hairo and hara, the noun and verb for joy, that is the root behind grace. So now think about grace again. Grace biblically is Jesus died on the cross to give us eternal life and forgive us of our sins and take us from death to life. Yes. But behind that word, grace is a gift of joy. You got that? It's not just getting saved. It's not just that you're going to get to go to heaven someday and wear a white robe and stand around and be really good for eternity. Again, most people seem to think that heaven is kind of boring, but it's better than hell. <laughs> right? But if you really want to live, oh, Jesus, you know, the teenagers say, please don't come yet, I haven't had sex. Right? As if heaven will be sexless and joyless and ecstaticless. You got that? And Jesus tells us, I've come to give you life and give it to you abundantly, to the max. So I want you to get this point that behind grace is the idea of joy, nirvana, over-the-top ecstasy that doesn't bite you with the backside and goes on forever and is good. Is amazing. That's what God wants for us. So there's more behind grace than just, oh good, I don't have to go to hell, you know, I can go to heaven. He came to give us life to the max. Really, that's what joy is. Joy is life to the max. Exponential on steroids. So that's behind grace. Joy is behind grace. And both of those are behind Eucharisto. Because Eucharisto is you haris. You haris. Okay? So let's figure that word out and then it'll make sense. I see you looking at me funny, some of you. Haris is grace, hara and hairo, joy and rejoicing, the cumulative accumulation of existence beyond itself, a high that never ends with no side effects. Now, the word Eucharistia or Eucharisteo comes, starts with the little prefix you, which means good or well. You've been through this many times if you've been in this church for a few years, but we'll do it once more. As in eulogy. What, where do you give a eulogy? At a funeral. What do you say in the eulogy? They can be the worst scoundrel on earth, but during the eulogy, you tell what a wonderful person they were. Because eulogy comes from eulogia, eulogos, which is a good word. That's what a eulogy is. It's a good word. So it doesn't matter that somebody was lousy. You, in a eulogy, you figure the good words and you say the good words about them. Right? So you means good or well. Um, eulogia is used in this place. You remember that Mary had an angel show up and say, Good news, Mary! You're going to be pregnant. You're going to give birth to the Son of God. And she goes, how's this going to work? I've never known a man. No sex, no kids. And God says, no problem, the Holy Spirit will take care of that. Right. Okay. Behold the handmaiden of the Lord. And then what does she do? She split town in haste to see Elizabeth. Because the angel said, if it's hard to believe, I'll tell you something else. Your old cousin Elizabeth is pregnant. You know, this lady in her 80s, she's pregnant. Let's go see her. Mary runs away from Nazareth down to the hill country of Judea to see Elizabeth. Because what is likely to happen to Mary back in Nazareth when she starts to reveal pregnancy unmarried? She's a good shot at getting stoned to death. God says, good news, you're going to be pregnant. And they'll probably want to kill you. 
So she runs to Elizabeth, and when she walks in the door of Elizabeth's house, Elizabeth spoke with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And both of those blesseds are eulogia. Well spoken of are you among women. And well spoken of is the fruit of your womb. Now, excuse the language, but back in Nazareth, she's going to be called a whore and the baby a bastard. Right? Not well spoken of. But she gets down to, uh, to Elizabeth, and Elizabeth says, well spoken of are you, and well spoken of is your child. Mary needed to hear that. Okay? But that's just an illustration of eulogia. Well spoken. So, you charis is good grace. Well, good. Get it, Dr. Scott? Good words, well spoken. Good grace, well graced. Okay? So, here's the point I'm trying to wind up on here. Giving thanks is not just about thanking someone for all the things they've done. God, thank you for doing this, and when I was in trouble, you did this, and when I had a need, you did that. And we've kind of created an artificial differentiation between praise and thanksgiving. We say praise is praising God for who he is, character, being. So if you praise another person, you're treating them as a human being rather than a human doing. Whereas if you praise somebody, you should be praising them not for what they've done for you, but for who they are. I love you. I appreciate you. You are this kind of person, and I'm excited about that. Whereas Thanksgiving, we've turned it into thank you for what you've done. But that's really not good Greek, which of course never mattered to you, but it will now. <laughs> really, giving thanks is awfully close to praise. Because it's good, gracious words towards the person. It can be good, gracious words about what you've done for me. It can be good, gracious words about who you are to me. So we really don't need to narrow giving thanks down to doing. It also is the area of being. Okay? Now praise in the Greek is doxa, from which we get the doxology, the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessing flows. And then... The word for thanksgiving is Eucharistia. So, what I've tried to share with you here is it all starts with hurrah, <laughs> life to the max, which is what he offers me in grace, which is what I express back to him in thanksgiving. Does that make sense? Okay, now let's apply that to three verses. Number one, 1 Thessalonians 6, 5, 16 to 18. Rejoice always. That's hara, hiero, okay? Rejoice always. So what does Paul want us to live like? We're walking around with our head in nirvana, right? We're walking around a bubbling spring of joy. Always? Always? Have you ever noticed how your attitude changes even the bad stuff you're living through? Pray without ceasing. By the way, there are three commands. Rejoice, pray, and give thanks. They're all in the, in the imperative, second person plural. So y'all rejoice, okay? Nobody rejoiced. There you go. If I say y'all rejoice... You should do something. Y'all pray. You pray. And in everything, you all give thanks. In everything. 
in everything. Be voicing back to God the wonders of his grace. Does that make sense? In everything. That means all circumstances, good times and bad, high times and low. Be good gracing towards God. It involves his forgiveness, salvation, hope, peace, life, blessings, food, friends. So a lot of us had friends and people we knew in the town of Paradise. And a week ago Thursday, the entire town burned down. And we have numerous friends who lost everything. I know the associate pastor, Dan Martell, who's been there many years, I've known him since college, lost everything. The church burned to the ground. In everything, be expressing good grace back to God. Can we do that? I'd like to suggest the only way we're ever going to manage to do that is if we are in an incredibly deep daily relationship with him where we have come to trust him to the point where we understand that no matter what's happening right now, the end is going to be good. And that verse that gets overused and misused, but all things work together for good, by the way, if you stop there, it's not a truism. It's false. All things do not work together for good. All things work together for good to those who are loving, ongoing, present tense, who are loving the Lord and who are the ones called according to his purpose. The called ones. I will fear no evil even though I walk through the valley of, literally in the Hebrew, deep darkness. The word death isn't in there. Have you been through a valley of deep darkness? Apparently, we can have the kind of relationship with Jesus where we can walk through the valley of deep darkness with praise and thanksgiving and good gracing going on in our hearts back to God. Because we know that he'll get us through to the other side and the other side will be incredibly good beyond anything we can imagine with no downside. Even if you die in the valley of deep darkness, it's still going to be okay. Because it's the resurrection and the life. So this is a challenge that I'd like to suggest there's no way you can do this outside of a deep, intimate walk with Jesus Christ. Because you can't fake this stuff. I guess I better move on. Second verse. Well, this is why, before we go to the second verse, Jesus can say, blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and revile you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Hurrah! Rejoice <laughs> in that day and leap for joy. And believe it or not, that little word leap there is the Greek word skiptao. Do you need an explanation? Skip. You know, when you see a little child skipping, you envy them for two reasons. Number one, they have boundless energy. <laughs> oh, if I had that energy still. And number two, they're carefree. I remember a couple times in my life looking at a young adult who was mentally challenged and permanently at age eight and almost envying them. Never known a day of self-consciousness in their life. Everything is exciting and new, <laughs> right? Wouldn't it be great to go through life like that? Yeah, wow. So rejoice, hurrah, and skip. Why? 
Your reward is great in heaven in all, for in like manner the, did the fathers to the prophets. So when you go through troubles, God says rejoice and skip for joy. Wow. Okay, next verse. Ephesians 5.20, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Does that mean I'm supposed to, if I lose my house in the fire, I'm supposed to say, thank you, Jesus, for burning my house down. I get cancer. I say, thank you, Father, for giving me cancer. You know, my spouse is killed by a drunk driver. Thank you, Lord. Or you're about to lose your life due to people angry at you for your faith. Thank you that I'm about to die. Are we, is that what it really, I've heard people say, it says there, for, oh, but you got to read the original language. The word for is the word huper, from which we get the English word hyper. Now, hypo means under, a hypodermic, under the skin. Hyper means over. It does not say give thanks for everything. It says give thanks over everything. No matter what is happening, you are living in hyperspace. You know, we have airplanes, we have supersonic airplanes, and then we have hypersonic airplanes, right? They fly over everything. Doesn't matter what's going on down there. They go right over the top with great speed and wonder and noise, right? It doesn't say you're supposed to be, get to the point where you thank God that you just lost your job or you just had your child die or whatever horrible thing happens in this world. But we can live in the kind of relationship with God where we soar above it. We don't get mired down in it because we know, again, the ending is going to be good. So be thankful above and beyond all that's going on. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, that means all the martyrs that made it through in the past, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnared us, ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the hurrah, joy, that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and was, has sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. I want you to notice, Jesus was not thanking God for the cross. But he went through it, hating every minute of it, but soaring above it because of the joy set before him. The power to go through because you can see beyond, because you trust in the Lord. The joy of grace can be expressed back to God above and beyond whatever's happening on earth. Does that make sense? All right, third verse. Therefore, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for all people. Are we supposed to thank God for every person in our lives? We can have some pretty tough people in our lives once in a while, can't we? I mean, I have to thank God for him or her. Again, hyper. It's not for, it's above and beyond. First of all, that supplications, prayer intercessions, and giving of thanks be made above and beyond to all people. Don't let people get you down. Just keep your head in the Lord and keep raising him. Walk in grace. And for kings, that's another hyper word. Kings were the ones killing the people in the time of Paul. And he says, live in God's grace above, even the kings. Whether you like the president or not, live in the grace of God, not with your feet mired down in the political hoopla. Kings and those in authority, so we may lead a quiet and peaceable life, and so on. For it, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. You know what that says? God's greatest desire is that that person that's driving you buggy or trying to kill you will be your neighbor in heaven forever and ever and ever. Amen. 
Right? That's God's desire. Even after they kill you, he's going to try to save them. And you could move into heaven with your murderer next door. And God will be excited about that. Because you will both have been transformed. Does that make sense? Therefore, be anxious for nothing. No matter what's happening, don't let anxiety pull you down. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with good gracing towards God, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and minds through Christ Jesus. Folks, we cannot explain or understand what joy through grace can do to our lives and cause us to live in good gracing back to God above all the garbage that our feet get in. But we can experience it. And the world will go, what's with this person? We don't get it. It doesn't make psychological sense. It doesn't make rational human sense. But they got something. And the world will have to make one of two reactions. They'll either say, man, I'd like some of that. Or they'll say, we got to kill it and get rid of it because they can't stand all that hurrah going on. Does that make sense? Hey, being full of joy can get you killed. But you'll go with the peace that passes understanding because you know that all things will work together in the end for good. So that's what I wanted to tell you today about Thanksgiving. Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest, right? We can have rest in the middle of restlessness. Jesus, uh, Paul says, we do not sorrow as those who have no hope. We do sorrow when people die, but we don't sorrow in hopelessness. We have hope in the middle of hopelessness. We have rest in the middle of restlessness. We have confidence in the middle of uncertainty because we know if we're in the process of a love relationship with God, we are the call according to his purpose. We know that he will take us through the valley all the way to the end, and the end is going to be exponentially better than we can possibly ever imagine. So, keep your eyes on the prize. Keep the good grace flowing back to God. And you can go through anything. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for thanksgiving. Thank you for grace. Thank you for joy. Thank you for leading us to it, because there's only one place to find it, and that is in you, for you are life. Lord, may our time be spent with you that we can trust you to the point that no matter what's going on, we can live in the good gracing of thanksgiving. May we be Eucharisting all over the place. No matter where our feet are, our minds can be thanking you, praising you, because we know you're going to get us through this, you're going to get us out the far side, and it's going to be better than we can imagine. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.